Hi, kitty cat. Yeah, that's going to be a problem. Hey, you all. Farmer Jesse here. Got another great video for you this week coming from Arizona Worm Farm in Phoenix, in which owner Zach Brooks discusses how they have developed a super efficient process to make fresh, biologically active vermicompost. Um, he also discusses how and more importantly, why they breed over 50 pounds of worms every week for sale to farmers and gardeners and the best and cheapest way to get started making vermicompost on your own farm or commercially. Just excellent stuff all the way around. If you did not watch this video, I would go ahead and do that because these are two very complimentary videos and we'll give you the full context. Um, a couple quick notes. This entire video was shot by my partner at notillgrowers.com, Jackson Roulette, host of the excellent Collaborative Farming Podcast. So huge shout out to him for his work. I'm very jealous he got to go visit this place. Also, this video was paid for in part by a grant from Southern Sayer and made possible like all of our work through the enduring support of our Patreon members at patreon.com slash no-till growers. Literally, like, if you appreciate this video or any of our videos, consider signing up. Those dollars go really far in making you more free content. You can always support our work as well by simply picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook from notillgrowers.com specifically, where the proceeds go to making you more excellent content like this. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel, like the video if you like the video. Otherwise, let's get to it with Zach Brooks at Arizona Worm Farm. This is our vermicomposting process. This is how we produce worm castings on a commercial scale. We use a wedge system. Uh, the, uh, we feed the front of the wedge, and that's what they're doing um, back there behind us. We put about two inches of pre-composted food waste onto the front, and we water the front. The, the whole front of this is, is covered with worms. The worms will continue to make their way across the face following the food after they've consumed all the organic material. The organic material on the, on the backside can then be harvested. So the worms move across the face, they move away from the castings. Once they've moved away from the castings, we slice off a chunk of what's largely pure worm poop. We run it through our screens and, and, and screen it for our customers, or we use it um, in our gardens and fields. This gets watered uh, two or three times a week here in Arizona in the, summer, in the wintertime and every single day in the summertime. Uh, these are red wigglers and we try and keep as pure a herd as possible. Red wigglers operate between 30 degrees and 90 degrees quite comfortably, which is why we like them. They're good composters with a good, uh, with a good heat range. We never worry about our temperatures, our soil temperatures getting below 30 degrees. If we have even a hard freeze here in Phoenix, it'll be ambient temperatures in the high 20s and the soil will stay in the 50s. The summertime, um, we do worry about temperatures on the high end. Um, surprisingly, we solve that, we, we treat that problem with a little less water because water conducts heat. And so we let the wedges get a little bit drier in the summer than they are in the winter time. Um, and we have misting systems that we turn on when, the, when it's very, very dry and very, very hot. It's all under 100% shade. When we started, uh, we thought there were gonna be some advantages to having, having uh, the worms under 50 or 75% shade. What we found is 100% shade uh, is, it, it is more effective for the worms. So you may not get a good handful, but you can see that there's, um, and they're, they're afraid of the sun, so they'll move out of the light. Um, but you'll see that there'll be worms throughout the whole face of the wedge. And we'll get densities varying from spot to spot, so some of them will have more worms than others. But the worms will stay where the food is, and so they'll consume the face. You can see here that this wedge, uh, I'm sorry, the face of the wedge has moved far enough away from the backside that the worms will have traveled at least three or four feet away from the material. You can see down there where we're harvesting the material, but we'll come through here and we'll, um, we'll slice off the back piece of this and there'll be almost no worms in it at all. 
So if we're giving it the right amount of time, they've consumed all the organic material. What's left is as close to pure worm poop as we can get, and the worms themselves have, have moved on. That material gets sliced off. It's, um, it'll be 75-80% humidity in, in the face where we're feeding them. We'll let it dry to 50-55% on the backside because we still want active bacteria and fungi and you need water and, and air to do that. But we'll, we'll, we'll let it dry out a little bit for screening. Gets put into these wagons overnight where it dries out just slightly more. And then it goes to our screening plant where the larger pieces, any uh, un uh, decomposted mulch gets screened out and we're left with as close to pure worm poop as we can get. Quarter inch screen and an eighth inch screen separates the the um, overs, the basically the unconsumed mulch into uh, larger pieces and smaller pieces. The smaller pieces which are close to being fully consumed get put back into the wedges to be used to help them grow fungi. The larger pieces get put out we either use them as ground cover in our gardens because it's um, that stuff's um, re it's well inoculated with microbes, um, well on its way to breaking down completely. The castings fall down onto the uh, conveyor and get and get separated. So one person can screen two three thousand pounds of castings in a day using this setup, which we've um, the the equipment we purchased, but then we modified the configuration so that it works to kind of optimize what it, what it does. And then what you'll see over here, so this is, this is the finished product. And we're doing between, again, six and eight yards a week, which is pretty much what we sell here at the farm. So we do our best uh, castings that were in the wedge on day one get screened overnight on day two and sold on day two or day three. So you're only a day or two away from a fresh casting when it goes out the door. That lets us ensure the most microbially rich product possible. The, the worm castings don't have a tremendous amount of, the, you know, the NPK, the amount of, of nutrients are relatively modest in worm castings. What you're really trying to buy is that, you're trying to buy those microorganisms. You want that bacteria and fungi and helpful nematodes and protozoa. Those are the things that convert what's in your uh, compost into what your plants need at the time that they need them. If you, if you buy it in a sealed plastic bag in one of those big box stores, months and months old, it still has those chemical properties, but the microbes can't. The microbes need air and water uh, in order to survive, and so the microbes uh, are, not, are not there. So we sell it $690 for a yard of, verm of castings versus $135 for the mix versus $60 for our compost. And we have a commercial compost that's available as inexpensively as $24. This process, the castings process, and so we do these in an eight foot section, which is what we recommend people start with just to learn it. But once you get an eight foot section, you can expand this to any size and it works really, really well. Um, so we have this process optimized. Um, I think there's one more machine that we need to get, which we're, we're playing with, but other than that, this is a really good process. Very reliable, very consistent. We can, we know by linear foot how much castings, what, what the input's gonna be, what the time frame's gonna be, and what the outputs are gonna be, like clockwork. Okay, so this is our worm breeding operation. Uh, caution for those of you watching this, this is not for amateurs. Uh, if you just want to get started in the worm business, you should start with a worm wedge. You should start producing castings initially. Get used to raising uh, and caring for worms. They're livestock like any other on a farm, and there are, it, it takes some time to get uh, adept at managing that herd. Um, this is our breeding operation, so the way, the most effective way to produce the largest number of worms um, is to do, is use a, a mortar tray system. We put about, a, 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 a little, about three quarters of a pound of breeding worms into one of these bins, and uh, those worms are, they'll be larger and fatter than the worms that we have outside. Uh, we put them in an inert bedding, which has very little food value. And then every single day we sprinkle food on the top 
that gets the worms to come up and, and hook up with each other. It's the only place that there's food. Uh, a worm in this type of a setting will produce a cocoon about once a week. So the six or 700 worms that are in here over a three week period will produce about 2,000 cocoons. We use a uh, light table process to separate the breeding worms from the cocoons. These trays are just packed with all those little yellow and orange uh, little dots right there. Those are all cocoons. So the light tabling, we put them on these and just uh, take a layer off a little bit at a time. And we just do this um, over and over and over again until we'll end up with all of the bedding and cast and uh, cocoons over on this side. On um, this side, it'll just be a pile of worms. The cocoons go into grow out bins. The breeding uh, container is set at 68 degrees. The grow out is set at 81 degrees. Uh, we put those in a grow out between three and four weeks until they hatch, and then approximately eight weeks after that. Each cocoon will have between one and four eggs in it. We average about two. So uh, each tray will produce 2,000-ish cocoons. It'll produce 3,000-ish worms. And we do that 20 times. Um, it, each, each, each week, we have 20 trays. So 20 trays produces about 60,000 worms a week, which is what we're able to grow here on the farm. Uh, here in Phoenix, they're in insulated containers because we need to keep those temperatures constant all year round. So we keep the breeding at 68 degrees, we keep the grow outs at 81 degrees. One of the key products that we sell here at the worm farm is worms. There's a worldwide shortage of worms, combination of um, uh, climate change and some adverse weather events have uh, really decimated the commercial worm growers. So there's just not, there's a, there's a, uh, a worldwide shortage of worms. Here in Phoenix, um, we're able to convince backyard gardeners and farmers that instead of using commercial fertilizer, they should use worms and worm castings as part of an organic no-till garden. That produces a regenerative soil that absorbs carbon rather than releasing it and has all kinds of benefits. But the uh, results that people get when they put worms in their gardens are extraordinary. What the worms do is to produce those microorganisms that allow that transformation to take place in the root zone at the root level. And beyond that, the roots will produce produce exudates, and those exudates will encourage the right kinds of microbial growth to help supply the plant with the material that it needs. So if you put worms in your garden, if you put worm castings and organic material in your garden, you'll have a lazier garden with a significantly better um, uh, outcome. You'll get more produce with less insects. And so as we've shown people, as people have seen the impact of having worms in their gardens, um, they want to buy them. And in order for us to sell them, we gotta breed them, and so that's what this process is designed to do. The wedge process is optimized to produce the highest level of castings. And while I could harvest some worms from that, I typically don't. That process is very, very simple, and it works quite flawlessly. And so we don't harvest worms for sale out of our wedges. We use this process instead to, to maximize the number of worms that, that can be produced. Worms are self-limiting animals, which means that if there's not enough space or food, they stop producing cocoons. So they need to feel like there's plenty of food and plenty of space for them to produce babies. Temperature is also critically important in the, in the optimization of worm breeding, which is why we do the breeding, uh, the breeding operations in a temperature-controlled environment. Out there, we get enough worms reproducing to keep the wedges healthy but not enough to where we could really harvest at the rates that, that we're harvesting. So we had to set up a, a process specifically designed to produce lots of worms for sale, and that's what this process is. The, the uh, worm breeding is not our most profitable line uh, because it's quite labor intensive. Um, we're able to produce, as I say, about 50 or 60 pounds of worms a week reliably now but it's taken us a solid three and a half or four years of experimentation to get to that point. We sell the worms for between 40 and $45 a pound. Um, and we estimate that our labor costs to produce them are 
between $18 and $19 a pound. So uh, it's an expensive, time-consuming process. And like any other livestock, you can have um, unexpected issues which can impact the herd, can impact the breeding processes, can impact harvest and hatching. But the price of worms has increased dramatically over the last two years. And I think it's reasonable to, to expect that it will continue to increase. The demand uh, has been extraordinary. We've never been able to breed enough worms to meet the demand just in our local market area. Um, we track and measure the number of customers that we have. And in a metropolitan area with, uh, I don't know, four, five, six million people, um, we've sold worms to 10 or 12,000 of them. As more and more people become aware of the capabilities of worms, we anticipate that demand going up over time. Too high? Because you can't pull air from anything. There's nowhere to pull air from. This is Clark oh, Furlong. Good. Clark is the. Um, hey, Clark. He's our original worm farmer. Uh, so what you're looking at here is is these are just grow outs. Uh, each of those trays produces 2,000 um, grow outs. Um, these are this this particular batch is still uh, nothing's hatched. So it's just been here for a week or two and the cocoons are still obvious. We'll leave it, again, we just leave it here. We, we monitor them. Once they start producing, um, once the, the babies hatch, then we start feeding them. And uh, we raise them in here until they get to sufficient size to be able to sell. And this process takes between uh, two and three months to get a worm from a cocoon until it's uh, large enough for sale. And depending on the age of the bed, you can see that the worms will all be. So like these are, are quite small. Um, that worm is about eight weeks old. And we'll leave it there at that size. You can see that they're just starting to get, um, they're, they're just starting to get some size. We'll feed them. Because we do sell them by the, by the pound, and so we want them to be as fat as possible. So this will get two tablespoons of Purina worm chow every single day and they'll consume that. Um, these are uh, relatively young also. And they'll consume that, uh, that two tablespoons. This is about, this should be about uh, 3,000 worms of varying sizes, but mostly, uh, you know, that size. And they'll grow to full size in another four to six weeks. It's a three-week process for the initial cocoon production. It's a three-week process, so one and a half months to get to where they hatch. And then it's two to three months to feed them enough to where they get full size and ready for sale. A lot of time and a lot of labor. Once they're in this, so there's not a ton of labor in this. Uh, we take a powdered food and we add it to the top. You can actually see it uh, from this morning. So every single day, somebody comes in here, we touch every bin to make sure that the moisture level is right. We add a, 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 a layer of, um, of worm chow. This one's getting one, this particular rack's getting one teaspoon every single day. Um, and then it gets watered. So the whole feeding and watering process in here is less than an hour. Um, but, we, but it's, again, we do that um, consistently every single day. And an interesting side note for people who are considering doing this is to recognize that both the compost and then the castings and then the worm growth products, you have six to nine months worth of work before you get your first penny of revenue. So it's a, it's a time consuming process and you need, to, you need to have the resources to be able to wait that time to get a good product. This, the process works exactly the same. So you can see here, these were the first wedges that we put in. What you're looking at is two pieces of plywood, which used to be 10 bucks a piece and now they're 50 bucks a piece, but it's just two pieces of plywood, uh, a foot of compost at the base to start, and 10 pounds of worms. Those 10 pounds of worms retail are, is about $400. So for $500, you can be in the worm castings business and then just start adding compost to it. This is, this is where we recommend everybody start and we recommend everybody start with eight feet. Um, feed one, work one, understand how to keep worms alive in it. 
understand the process, to, to, to extend it, and to harvest from it. That's the perfect way to start. Once you get that working, you can replicate that as big as you want it to be, and the process is exactly the same. So we moved from an eight foot wedge to an 80 foot wedge because the um, logistics of feeding and harvesting are better, it's more efficient. Um, but, but I would absolutely, I'm just, I'm screaming in my head, anybody who wants to start, start with eight feet, start with 10 pounds of worms, start with a less than $1,000 investment, um, because that will, that will teach you what you need to know to get this right. Once you get it right, then you can expand it um, in a pretty simple and straightforward way.